Good afternoon. We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. It's a great pleasure to be here with Frank Capp, who is, seems to be one of the busiest drummers on the West Coast from the description he just gave us of his upcoming weekend. We're at the LA Classic Jazz Fest, and thanks, uh, Frank, for coming in and squeezing in some time with us. Well, it's a pleasure, Monk. Thanks for inviting me. Did this kind of popularity come overnight for you? Well, uh, Actually, I've kind of been, over the, the last many years, I've been kind of uh, hidden, as it were, by uh, studio work. Mm. But uh, back in uh, 1976, uh, I decided that I had enough of that, you know. I mean, not that I still don't do an occasional studio call, but I was, that was my main focus after I got off the road with the bands. The many bands I played with and acts and all that, I decided to settle in with the studios, and uh, I made a good living doing that, and never gave up, ever gave up playing jazz. But unfortunately, when studio musicians don't yeah. get any any exposure to the jazz public, right. and so it wasn't until '76 when I started Juggernaut with Nat Pierce that I kind of uh, threw the towel in on the studio mm. stuff, and so. It didn't happen overnight. Yeah. You know, I've been around a long time, as my uh, <laughs> age will attest. You're an East but, Coast, moved to the West right. Coast. I, guy, I right. I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, and uh, I joined Stan Kenton when I was 19. Wow. That was my first professional job. And, That's uh, a kind of a high pressure oh, job for first yeah, one, too. It, it really was. And I was, I was still wet behind the ears, <laughs> as it were. And, uh, but, but Stan was good. He nurtured me and helped me along. And and uh, after that band, I I did several other road bands: yeah. Neil Hefty's band and Billy May, Charlie Barnett. Uh, and I worked with a lot of singers: Peggy Lee, Ella Fitz. Uh, I worked with Dorothy Dandridge for a while, and then she had a sad ending, hmm. committed suicide. But uh, I also worked with Betty Hutton. I did a lot of those kind of things. The only, uh, and, and uh, we were just mentioning about Andre Previn. I worked with Andre for, for uh, all, almost eight years. I must have made about 25 albums with him. Wow. It was right after the My Fair Lady uh, album, which made uh, qu quite a bit of noise, as it were, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, on the charts, et cetera, back then. And uh, that uh, My Fair Lady album was done with Shelley Mann and Leroy Vinegar. And Shelley was so busy, incredibly busy, he couldn't travel with Andre, so Andre hired me and Red Mitchell. And Red and I and Andre were with the Andre Previn Trio for over eight years. We wow. traveled, made albums with everybody from, from um, uh, Mahalia Jackson <laughs> to, uh, to uh, Doris Day. For vocalists, and we did. Uh, we had J.J. John. We did an album with J.J. Johnson. We did uh, an album uh, with a whole bunch of singers, you know, a choir. We did a lot of things. Andre, Andre was very prolific mm -hmm. in that day. He still is, for that matter. But he used to write. Andre used to write uh, movies, a lot of movie yeah. scores, and he th he also got tired of uh, the Hollywood scene and uh, aspired to be a a uh, uh, classical conductor, yeah. a la Leonard Bernstein. Mm -hmm. And he pursued that, so he dropped the trio and dropped jazz altogether, till he made it as a uh, right. classical conductor. 
That's not too many people have gone that route no. from jazz no. into classical. No. But he's back doing jazz again. Yeah. He's playing, uh, you know, the re recording and occasional album. Yeah. You must have had some, uh, from the work you're describing, did you have some um, actual percussion training when you were young or has uh, it kind of been? You know, oddly enough, um, I can still hear my mother reprimanding me for not practicing. <laughs> you know, get in here and practice. And uh, I did have some training. I went to Boston University, mm -hmm. and uh, I was in Boston University when Stan called me to, uh, to join the band. So I left, I think, in my junior year. I never got my degree, but I had, I had enough classical uh, uh, training as, as a percussionist to, uh, to get me through most of what I would need later in the studios. Because yeah. as, as, as a 19 year old, my aspirations were to be a, a big band jazz drummer. Right. And I've never lost that aspiration. I'm still trying to be a big band jazz drummer. <laughs> it must be a great feeling to drive a big band, I would yeah, think. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy it very much. My, I, I love working with my band, but I love working with a lot of other bands. Uh, as, as you just mentioned, this weekend is, is pretty busy with me. And uh, tomorrow I'm, go, uh, I'm gonna be down at the, uh, the Irvine Marriott where there's another jazz party going on with Terry Gibbs' Dream Band. Mm -hmm. And then uh, tonight, I'm going up to Santa Barbara to do a concert with Super Sax. Now, Med Flory has, has added a brass section to Super Sax and four voices. So it's wow. now, now uh, uh, the, uh, the LA voices, he calls it. Sue Rainey is, is uh, the lead singer and, uh, uh, and the brass section. So it's kind of, uh, I don't know what he calls it, the, the super sax with voices, or wow. super sax, I, don't, I don't know. Doesn't matter what it's called. Mm -hmm. It's still it's still big band, and mm -hmm. it's fun to do. I like uh, I like all kind of all kinds of playing. I enjoy doing what we're doing here at this, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm playing. I just I just finished. As I said last night, I went down and did a set with with uh, Terry Gibbs and Buddy DeFranco down at the other hold, and that was that's about as you know bebopish as you can get. And I just finished, I got off the stage downstairs doing a, an out and out Dixieland yep. set. Yeah. You know? And I love it. I love it all. You got to change hats yeah, from one day right. to the next. Sure. I mean, uh, a lot of, there, were, there was a day when a lot of hippie musicians thought that uh, there was no validity in Dixieland or, mm -hmm. or, the, or the traditional swing. But that's not true. There's, there's great music everywhere. Yeah, it's really gratifying to, to be here and, and see, um, first of all, the, the old veterans. But then there's some younger guys coming up, too, who seem to have oh, a pretty yeah. good handle yeah. on the classic mm -hmm. swing. Well, you know, what's so happened, thanks to our education system, they have allowed uh, or have created jazz programs. When I was in school, you couldn't even use the word jazz. That was a no-no. There was no jazz education at all. In my high school, all I got was a music appreciation class, and we listened to classics. Yeah. Nothing. Jazz was an illegitimate music as far as that, that era of thinking was concerned. But uh, certainly we know better than that now, and, and certainly because of, of the great educational program, there's all kinds of uh, young kids coming up mm -hmm. and you say, geez, where'd they learn how to do that? Well, they learned how to do it in school. Yeah. All they need is a, a little, uh, to get out a little experience right. and get, you know, sand off some of the rough edges and they'll be, they'll right. be great. They'll be equally as good as any of us who so-called so uh, grew up with that yeah. music, you know. I think Herb Bella said uh, some of them just need to figure out what not to play now. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. But uh, uh, m music is all. All music uh, is great, except one. <laughs> okay. I got to tell kind, you this. What kind of music? <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna tell you this story about Buddy Rich. You know, okay. everyone, in the, everyone in the world knows Buddy, and uh, unfortunately, he uh, he had a brain tumor, and uh, uh, he was being prepared to go into surgery, and. Uh, 
it was you know they they was pro probably uh, sedated, and uh, he was on the gurney, and the nurse was was uh, about to give him a shot or something, uh, whatever, to, before going into surgery, and she said, uh, "Mr. Rich, are you allergic to anything?" And he kind of dazed, opened his eyes, and said, "Yeah, country western music." <laughs> Uh, now that'll give you an idea of that man's wit, and and I, I kind of feel the same way. I mean, actually, that's not a hat you're going to put no, on no, someday soon. No, absolutely not. All right. Um, can you describe to us what it's like to uh, to try to run a big band? Well, because I know you and Nat, you know. Yeah, we you, we've persevered a, a, a lot. More e even Terry, you know, Terry had Terry Gibbs had a great band in the fifties, that Dream Band. It wasn't called the Dream Band then, but uh, they he worked uh, uh, a couple of nights a week. Uh, the club called the Summit, and another one called the Sundown, uh, where he recorded all. Uh, if you're f not familiar with his albums, called. Uh, uh, the Dream Band, and they were re recorded by an engineer who just happened to, uh, uh, for a hobby, recorded the band, and and he made all of these these tapes that are now on Fantasy. I'm look, look at me, I'm I'm <laughs> pushing <laughs> Fantasy instead of my Go own company, it. which is <laughs> yeah, awkward. right. But but anyway, that band at that at that time, uh, uh, they they stayed together because there weren't. There weren't a lot of bands. Now, what's happening in L.A., there are a, there's a plethora of bands. I mean, every, if you've got any kind of re a, a music rehearsal band or anything at all, there, you know, you're now, you're now a big band leader. And uh, hmm. uh, it's, not, it's not easy keeping the band um, cohesive uh, unless you're working a lot. Yeah, you can't hold on to the personnel yeah. so much. Yeah, and uh, thanks be, for whatever reason, Juggernaut has always worked a lot for not being a traveling band, mm -hmm. you know, for not being a road band, like the Basie Band or Merce Ellington and, right. and all the other ghost bands. Yeah. You know, yeah. but uh, uh, it's, not, it's not an easy job, but, but we, we managed to keep most of the same musicians. We had Marshall Royal in our band right up till he died a few months ago, mm -hmm. right from the, our very first album. And uh, uh, a lot of guys that were with us at the, our very first album, uh, which was done in 1976, I think, was, uh, you know, Bill Green is still with us, a uh, couple of trombone players, Buster Cooper was, mm -hmm. until he just moved to Florida. And um, so, we have kept uh, a, a pretty consistent uh, uh, personnel on our orchestra, but it's not easy because you know you you, you can't. Everybody's got to make a living. Yeah, you right. got to make a living. You can't. It, it, unfortunately, this country's got its values all screwed up. Mm. And it's all screwed up. Uh, you know, musicians who spend and devote their life to become. Uh, uh, really facile on their instruments and uh, help create pleasure for people uh, that enjoy it, uh, make nothing. And, and some athletic dummy, you know, goes out and, and uh, bangs his head against uh, somebody else's helmet and they make millions, mm -hmm. millions, you know. But that's another story. Yeah, like that sure that. is. Um, Shortly after you got the band together, didn't you do an album with Joe Williams? Yes, we did. We that was our second album. Uh -huh. Our first album was uh, was um, uh, just called Juggernaut, and the reason it was called Juggernaut. Now that you've asked, <laughs> the reason it was called Juggernaut is because uh, Nat and I put the band together as for a one night situation to. To help a guy who had who was running big bands at a club called King Arthur's in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, he had hired Neil Hefty's band, and Neil disbanded before the engagement came up, and I was contracting for Neil, so the the, the club owner asked me to put a band together. I did. I got Nat. We went we were, we went out and we called it a tribute to Count Basie, and we worked that first night, and that was all it was ever going to be, 
and uh, the crowd liked it so much, and the club owner liked it so much, he said, you've got to come back next week. Well, we did, and we came back subsequent weeks for a couple of months, and Leonard Feather, the uh, uh, jazz critic for the LA Times at that, at that point, came out to review the band. And the next day in his article, it said, a juggernaut on Basie Street. That was the title of, of, of the review. Mm -hmm. So at that particular time, everybody had an, a name to their band. You know, uh, uh, Buddy Rich had the big band machine, yeah, yeah. and Louis Belton had big band explosion, and everybody, they, they, I mean, they were putting a tag on all of yeah. them. So I, I said, Nat, let's use the name Juggernaut. So uh, we, we subsequently recorded that first album, and uh, Carl Jefferson from Concord said, let's call the album Juggernaut. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish that we never used the word, quite frankly, but uh, because people don't know how to spell it. They're forever asking me, What's what is a mean? juggernaut? Uh -huh. and, and, and a lot of people call it the juggernauts, and it's not a plural, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway. Wow. What was it like working with Joe on that album? Do you Joe remember? Williams is, is a sweetheart. He's a great singer, and he is so laid back. I mean, he'll he'll come into a a, a, a gig situation. Of course, he's got to be feel pretty comfortable with who's on the the stand behind him. But he'll walk in. He won't want to. Don't have to rehearse anything, you know. And he'll bring his charts. Maybe maybe he won't bring his charts. Maybe we'll just fake stuff. He's, <laughs> he's so he's so easy to, to work with. And that album that we did live at the Century Plaza, um, we had we had recorded maybe three or four tunes other than what's on the album. And one tune, which we didn't plan to record, uh, which was Joe's Blues is an 11 minute thing. We were just, because we did it live and we were now, you know, catering to the audience yeah. rather than our, the microphones. Right. So uh, Joe just turned around and said, to Nat, B flat, man, put them here, down and count, count it up. And we, 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 and we played. And, uh, and if you've heard the album, it's, it's 11 minutes of joy for me. Wow. It's it's just wonderful, and we had no. It was the first and last time we've ever played that mm -hmm. that way, you know. And uh, and we liked it so much, we threw the other tunes that we planned to use on the album out, and just kept that one and uh, what the world needs now. That's that's interesting because that's one of the the parts about jazz I think that some people find so fascinating, like. How did you do that? He just said B flat, yeah. and you played for 11 minutes. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that's yeah. the the beauty of the music in some ways. Well, respects. there's an empathy that exists that, uh, uh, between most all professional musicians. Mm -hmm. Most all, sometimes not. <laughs> right. But but uh, uh, given a situation <clears throat> like this, certainly everybody kind of melted into one yeah. and it become cohesive. Give us um, a little idea of what a typical studio date would be like because this isn't something that Matt, like for instance students really have a handle on what well, it requires. Uh, well let me uh, let me uh, example something like a, a motion picture call, a motion picture session. Uh, what would happen is uh, you'd be given a call by a contractor to be at, uh, at uh, Warner Brothers studio or or uh, Universal, or MGM when it was MGM, whatever, and you'd go to the you'd go to the studio at nine o'clock in the morning, and uh, there would be 60, 70 musicians, depending. It could be a small group too, but, but and a lot of pictures used at that time large orchestras, and you walk in, and the librarian hands out the music. You open it to page one, <laughs> whatever, and play. There's the, here it is, one, two, three, play. Like you, and you have to play that music like you wrote it mm -hmm. or like you've been playing it mm -hmm. for, I mean, rarely, rarely in those days did you get chance to play it more than, than twice, maybe wow. three times. You'd run it down, you know, for, for notes to make sure there was no copying errors. And, uh, uh, then you begin recording, and if it was a tight budget picture, which is uh, which is the case now, 
You, you don't get a second chance. I mean, you've got to be you on the edge of your seat at all times. I guess. But that, I'll tell you something, what happens with that is almost similar to the example you just gave when I, you point B flat and you, yeah, and empathy exists with an orchestra like mm -hmm. that too, and you just, you, it just comes together. You know, you're all professionals, you're professional musicians, right. that's what you're expected to do. Right. You know? Play it right the first time. Yep, and yep. that's right. That's right. Gee. And, uh, uh, what about some of the, you've worked with some, some great soloists too, Art Pepper and Stan Getz. I work with Art Pepper, Stan I work Getz. with Stan Getz. Uh, I work with Marty Page. In fact, did you know Marty Page, the pianist? I know of him, I never he, met him. He's, he was a great arranger, mm -hmm. great arranger, great, uh, uh, he was a good, great piano player too. And uh, I did a lot of work with him. Uh, God, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> can't remember all. I mean, there's so many. I mean, you name them, I probably work with them. Benny Carter, uh, Ray Brown. Mm -hmm. um, Is there a I did, I did twelve years, twelve years of the Red Skelton show, when those who remember Variety Television, ah. uh, the, the Red Skelton. I did that with David Rose for. Was that live? Well, yeah, that was a live show. Did you ever have any? Uh, Interesting things happen in those kind of situations. That well, uh, not nothing. You know, there are always little glitches that you say, "Oops, I wish I could do that again," but you don't uh, get a chance to do it yeah. again. But uh, nothing really momentous, except that <laughs> that uh, Martha Ray, if you know who she yeah. was, she was a singer. Every she used to come on the show and and uh, and the dress rehearsals. The dress rehearsals, CBS, every office in CBS was closed during the dress rehearsal because they all funneled down into Studio 33 where we were rehearsing because between Red and, and Martha, Martha, it was the most risque, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> dirty show. It wasn't about to make the it on the air that way. Oh, huh? no, it was never. <laughs> I, I often wondered, and I think someone might have have taped the dress, those dress rehearsals, and if they do, they, they, they're a gold mine if they uh -huh. ever get, because yeah. they're, they're, I mean, in today's uh, world, what she said and what he said, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. at that time, it was very, very funny and right. considered very dirty, but if, if you watch any of the, the uh, <laughs> cable, tele, uh, cable mm -hmm. comedy shows now, God, that sense of humor is yeah. just repulsive, yeah. some of them. Uh -huh. Anyway, well, we've uh, had a great time talking. We with didn't you talk here. about Count Basie. Well, we got to talk about Count you, Basie. You have seven and a half minutes left. So oh, I'm do. sorry. Um, I, I thought my watch was slow. What, okay. uh, as um, we've had some great conversations with people trying to figure out what was it that made the Basie band swing like it did, and uh, well. I mean, there could be a lot of theories, but first, uh, first of all, I think it comes from the leader. I mean, Count Basie had a great, great sense of time. He he was a, he was a swinging piano player. He could hit two notes, and you could feel the swing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe that's where it stems. Secondly, he had great arrangements. Or maybe that's thirdly. Maybe secondly is the men, because he had great swing employers. He had the, he had the, the cream of the crop back, back in the 40s. I mean, you you couldn't every every band in in the country at that time idolized the Count Basie band for its swing, mm -hmm. swinginess, its looseness, and its. Joe Jones, old Papa Joe Jones, was uh, uh, one of the main contributors to that. Um, and uh, Sweets Edison was on that band, and Snooky Young. Right. And I did a set with Sweets last night. And I'm doing my 130 set as well. Right. with Snooky. Well, we spoke with them yesterday, yeah. and it was yeah. oh. marvelous. Oh, you talked. You we had them. Oh, yeah. that must have been great. Uh. I mean, Sweets has got some of the funniest expressions. I don't know. I, I doubt very much whether you used them all, but uh, you know, like some of those uh, southern colloquialisms mm -hmm. you call them, like. Uh, He's tighter than a chicken's instep, you know, <laughs> you know that kind of thing, you know. He's, uh, 
Uh, he's so cheap, he's got enough money to air condition a cotton field. You know, that's Wasn't he the guy who said, if you looked any sharper, I'd be bleeding? Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> he has, he's got a million of those, and, and something that I wouldn't want to talk yeah. about here. But Sweets is great, you know, it was so much fun playing with him. He still has got, he still has that great a sense of time and swing. He doesn't have to play a lot of notes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, tempo doesn't bother him anything. The only thing I noticed last night, which I haven't worked with Sweets now for a, a couple of years. I haven't had been on the same stand with him, but uh, I noticed he has to sit down now when he plays. Mm -hmm. He sits on a chair. Yeah. I did a tour with Sweets and, and Buck Clayton in Europe. It was uh, called the Count's Men. It was all the old Basie yeah. alumni. And uh, Freddie Green was there. Nat played Count's part. I, I, I played the drums. And Joe Jones, who was alive at the time, uh, followed us around France. We did a, we oh, did a month fabulous. in France. And uh, at that time, he was, uh, he was ailing pretty bad. He was living I'd there? Li yeah, he uh -huh. was living in, in France. And so I, I, I got him up on the drums at one concert in Limoges. And uh, he was walking with a cane, and he sat down at the drums. And he, was a, he, he picked his sticks up. And Eddie Jones, who was the bass player, looked down and said, it's a ballad. The next tune is a ballad, you know? And Papa Joe looked over him in his cantankerous way, as he always was. He said, you don't tell me. I tell you. <laughs> 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 and, and so he proceeded to play. They played the, the ballad. Then, then they played a brighter tune, like mm -hmm. Jumping at the Woodside or something. And I really felt so sad because Papa Joe just lost, you know, he lost the dexterity. He yeah. just couldn't keep up the tempo. Mm -hmm. But uh, right to well, the end, he was a, He made know, his like, contribution. Oh, yeah, he sure you know. did. He sure did. Mr. Hi-Hat, you know. Yeah. Oh, they, he's the one who invented that style of playing. Uh -huh. But, uh, oh, I'm glad you... you this is going to be a great, sh great uh, contribution to your school. Whatever you're going to do with this. Yeah. Thing. Well, we're we we feel that this this music is such a big part of, of, it the, is. of this country. It is. That, Thank God I know. can kiss you for saying that. <laughs> I mean, it's American. It's heritage. You know. That's right. It's, I mean, homegrown. It, right. Uh, you know, all the the other art forms have come from Europe. Uh, that's what I say about our country. We've got a lot of catching up to do in the, mm -hmm. in, in that era. Well, some Area. people have mentioned that when they've gone to Europe, and the Europeans say to them, you know, your country's very young. Yeah. And yeah. In, in a way, I think that's yeah. Yeah. some of our problems stem from that, yeah. is that we have a ways to go. You know, you can, you can put the greatest marquee together with the greatest jazz stars in this country, and maybe, maybe you'll get a thousand people. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Not for sure. You go to Japan, you go to Europe, put with that same card and you'll have 50,000 people mm -hmm. or 20,000 people what vastly more than here people aren't interested in jazz here mm -hmm. except the few that understand and appreciate it and realize its meaning yeah and and it's it's not that difficult to understand people say well they don't understand it what's that understand can you feel can the you feel beat? It? can you feel the rhythm um, there you go well yeah. all right <laughs> i don't want to pontificate here, so, you well, know, get on my soapbox when we talk about, yeah. but it's really, really unfortunate that uh, someone told me that this was before the, uh, the, the Iron Curtain came down and all that, that in Russia, I've never been to Russia, but Benny Goodman went to Russia, and someone said that, that at that time, if you were a musician or an artist, you were revered over there, whether it be jazz, whether it be jazz music or classical music, the musicians made more than the doctors or, or engineers did. Mm -hmm. That's how they appreciated it. Uh, but maybe not so right. right now, I don't know. Anyway. Well, thanks so much Monk, for your time. It was a Been pleasure a... sitting here talking with you. Yeah. I, I'd like to talk about these kind of things. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I'm not a fountain of knowledge, but I do have my own beliefs. You have your opinions, <laughs> and we're, your opinions, we're right. glad to hear them today. Thank you. So for Hamilton, College Jazz Archives. I want to thank Frank Kapp for sharing all that wisdom with us, and I hope you get through your next three or four days where you seem to be playing constantly. Yes, sir. And, uh, I, I will. We're glad to hear your business. Music keeps you young That's and alive. It. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Monk. Mm -hmm.